Awesome. So my name is Jordan Harrod. I'm a PhD candidate in medical engineering and medical physics through the Harvard MIT Health Science and Technology Program, which is a program that I sought out uh, as an undergrad because of the very direct integration with the clinic that it really focuses on. So the work that I do and that my colleagues do is trialed based on active work with clinicians to make sure that we are really meeting the the, the needs of both patients and and addressing uh, existing medical problems, but but also with the goal of creating solutions that will integrate into the clinic that can actually help people that aren't uh, uh, limited by by practicalities and technicalities. And so as part of that, something that I think we talk a lot about is um, what happens when tools fail in the clinic. And for this talk, I'm going to focus on what happens when AI fails in the clinic, because I think that there are interesting case studies to to discuss here um, as it relates to how we how we can think about uh, these tools and how we develop them in the future. Um, I will note that I the slide deck was generated in part using AI. Um, you'll see the made with Ghana watermark at the bottom right. Um, I recommend the tool if you want to try it out. Um, but I just wanted to flag that up top. So uh, why, why talk about this in the first place? I think there are obvious answers as it relates to essentially misdiagnosis, uh, delayed treatment, the, the, the patient side level effects. Uh, there's also practical reasons to talk about this as it relates to increased healthcare costs, which, uh, as much as, uh, as much as I might want this to not be the case do drive a lot of the policy changes that underlie integration of, of new technologies in clinical settings um, and, and are something that I think are useful to, to think about as it relates to both developing new technologies but also advocating for new policy. Uh, but as someone who through my program has, has spent several months working on the inpatient internal medicine service and, and talking to clinicians about their experiences with AI tools, I actually think that the erosion of trust is, is probably the most interesting topic here. Um, because as much as the work that I do, I would love to see end up in clinical settings, um, as, as well as other tools that are developed by my colleagues, but that are developed by our, our, our colleagues here. Um, I do think that clinicians are a bit wary of this in my personal experience, um, and some of them have been burned a few too many times, and, and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from both how to develop these tools, but more importantly, how to, to integrate them into the clinic. And so I have two case studies here. Um, Dr. Price actually already mentioned one of them, so I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about it, but then we'll probably talk a little bit about a different one. Um, but the first one that I have here is actually IBM Watson Health. Um, I think that this is a really interesting case study of a company that had all of the resources that had all of the, the capital to create uh, uh, an AI based tool to integrate into healthcare and found that they couldn't get it to work. And so for, for people unfamiliar with IBM Watson Health, uh, it was originally designed as essentially an AI tool that relied on massive data sets, primarily relating to oncology, so primarily relating to cancer treatment. The data set they used was uh, specific to particular regions, primarily in the US. And when they deployed it as a test, for clinicians, what they found was that, and, and I think what many of us know, uh, is that you can't apply a data set that is specific to one population to a different one. The interesting thing here is that, and, and this also ties into my next case study, but the interesting thing here is that I think that it had not occurred to them that 
the data sets they were using from cancer patients from one region would not clinically translate to patients from another region. And I think that's interesting because I think it highlights how much things outside of the the, the biological model of medicine and, and the data that's associated with that go into uh, uh, distributions of, you know, instance rates of, of, of different healthcare outcomes and how much that really does affect um, how useful these tools are. So in this case, IBM Watson uh, was, was deployed in a few different healthcare centers and clinicians hated it. Um, I won't use the language that they used because it involves profanity but they were not happy with the results. They did not trust these systems. The systems were often wrong in terms of both their, their diagnostic skills, their prognostic skills, uh, and care plans. Uh, uh, and a lot of that just had to do with the fact that the, in this case, the instance rates of various cancers uh, has to do with environmental factors that are, are specific to different regions. So if you, in, in, I guess, leaning a little bit into my personal experience, um, I spent some time living in rural Pennsylvania. Um, instance rates of certain cancers were much higher there, and a lot of that had to do with um, large manufacturers dumping cancerous chemicals into bodies of water. And you just don't have that in other regions, and that was not accounted for in the system. They also... Uh, uh, I guess I would say undermine trust on the clinical side um, when it relates to clinicians because of the extra work that goes into having to correct these misdiagnoses. Uh, and, and so I think that this is, I'll get into what to learn from this aside from having diverse data sets and making sure that the, the, the data set distribution that you're working with matches the actual patient population that you're working with, um, but also as it relates to how to how to integrate these systems in a, in a landscape where clinicians are already wary. You know, this is not the first time that we've tried to integrate these kinds of systems. And because of that, People in clinical settings are, are very wary of these tools, both from a, a healthcare perspective, but also from an administrative perspective. So the second example that I was going to use uh, was this uh, uh, study from a few years ago that's in science um, that focuses on a predictive algorithm that aimed to assign patients to a higher level of care based on their uh, medical need, uh, which ended up failing because the variable that kind of zeroed in on was healthcare spending. And it turns out that people of color just spend less money on healthcare. And that's not a very good metric of, of how to uh, determine the severity of someone's medical need. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail on this um, because Dr. Price already, already went into it. But I, I do think this is an example of uh, a Another example of, of why clinicians don't tend to trust these things and why that is actually an angle that I think we should focus on more than we do. Um, but also is, is an interesting example of a case where I think unlike the IBM Watson Health situation, people were asking a very specific question. People were trying to solve a fairly specific problem and did not have a diverse enough team, did not have the people on hand to, to ask the correct questions uh, uh, in order to flag that this, this system is, is not working as planned. And so the other example that I think is, I guess, interesting on this part um, is a more recent one, and it's the fall of Babylon Health. So for people who are unfamiliar, Babylon Health uh, is a or is a, a company that um, is, is primarily based in the UK. Um, and they they hoped to uh, develop a massive biobank of patient data 
um, in order to essentially create uh, predictive primary care tools. Uh, about earlier this year, so I believe in yes yeah, September, um, the company has declared bankruptcy. <laughs> Um, and there have been a lot of very interesting postmortems, I guess I would say, on what, what exactly happened here. Um, there's a, 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 a few things to talk about. Um, I think one is that their model just did not work financially in the first place, which kind of ties into to healthcare spending and things like that. Um, but the the other was that in a similar way to the IBM Watson Health example, clinicians did not find the questions or the recommendations useful. And I've in my work, I've I've found that to be a trend in perspectives that clinicians have on these systems, and also a barrier to the actual integration of a system that may work very well. That, that may actually result in improved patient care or reduced load on clinicians. And I think that that's something that is important for us to think about when it comes to the development and deployment of these systems. So in terms of what we can learn, uh, I think that all of these things are, are true in terms of Navigating the complexities of, of integrating these systems into clinical workflows is hard, um, often due to, often for, for policy and healthcare administration reasons. Um, data accessibility is complicated due to HIPAA, but also international guidelines on, on how you can uh, acquire this kind of data uh, and, and particularly um, what you can do with it and how you can use it. Um, but I actually think that the, the human machine interaction, the human machine trust is an undervalued part of this in a landscape where clinicians already don't necessarily trust these systems in the first place. Uh, and I think that thinking about how, how we can rebuild that trust um, is an important and, and interesting problem and is probably the biggest takeaway that I have from the failures of various approaches to biomedical AI. So I've included all the references for this presentation here, uh, as well as all of my funding sources. Thank you all of them. And uh, thank you so much.